Welcome to Beyond My Crisis. I'm your co-host, Ron Rosnick. And I'm Vivian Gaspar. And right now, we need to examine what parents should do when they think their child or teenager is having a mental health crisis, what does it look like, and how to handle the situation ongoing. Today we have with us here Dr. Stacy Plichta, who's a public health professor at Cooney College. Welcome to our show, Dr. Plichta. Thank you very much for joining us and educating our viewers on a subject that I think is very infrequently dealt with in the forum that we're in right now. Thank you for having me yeah. here. We would like to cover what is something that a per parent should look mm. at that constitutes, first of all, a mental health crisis. What does that look like? Well, first, let me say that mental health issues are becoming more and more prevalent among teens. About 20% of teenagers meet the standard for clinical depression. About 20 to 25% have anxiety disorders. 10% um, engage in self-harm activities, such as cutting themselves. Um, over 500,000 teens a year have suicidal thoughts, serious thoughts of committing suicide, and 5,000 teens a year actually succeed. Is this a so nationwide statistic? This is a nationwide statistic. So for a parent, what are the indicators that, I'm a parent, what, what do I start having to look for? What? Um, there are lots of things you can look for. The most obvious ones are if your child is talking about not wanting to be here anymore or wanting to kill themselves, take that seriously. If they're talking about wanting to hurt other people, um, there are a lot of other things that can happen that constitute a mental health crisis that aren't so uh, as obvious. But the main thing is to use your parental instincts. You know, if you come across your child and they're crying uncontrollably and they're hysterical and they're talking about that they're no good and they're a bad person, um, you know, don't write that off as tea drama. Okay, so engage in a conversation with them, but we as parents are not going to fall into that drama. We're here to kind of guide them through it and have an understanding. And the understanding is that it's not drama, that it's important to take it seriously. Um, there are lots of other things you can look for. If your teen seems to have delusions, if they think there's someone out to get them, um, if they're talking very quickly with forced speech, if, if they seem to be falling apart, and there's many forms this could take, the main thing is, as a parent, if you're looking at your teenager and you think, I'm not comfortable leaving the room right now because my teen might hurt themselves or someone else, or I'm not comfortable leaving my child alone, um, you may be in the midst of a mental, a psychiatric, a mental health crisis. And at that moment, what are the best actions to take? The best actions are to get help. So one of the things every parent can do is know in advance of any crisis where the help can come from. So in New Jersey, for example, and this is true for every state, every county has a specific hospital designated um, that will do mental health screening for adolescents. Every county has something called a family support organization. You can typically find these online through um, the state's Department of Health um, that will list organizations that have resources that you can learn about in advance. So the first thing is knowing where to go. So once you know that, if your child, if you think they're having a crisis, you, you can do one of two things. If you feel that you can safely transport them to an adolescent psychiatric emergency department, you should do so. How is this any different depending on the age of your child, or is it any different? It's not really any different. Um, mental health problems can strike at any age. Um, they may manifest themselves differently in younger children versus older children. If you don't feel there's an immediate danger to the child or that you have to get the child help right that second, you can make an appointment, hopefully for the next day, with the child's pediatrician. But again, if you have any doubt at all, if you're feeling uneasy that your child may be hurt or really hurting and that you can't let this go, take them to get screened. Right. There's a stigma behind mental health practitioners. How do we counterbalance that? Um, the first thing is to, and it's true, the stigma is there and it's terrible because it's a huge barrier for people getting help. Okay, so um, let's break the barrier. Sure. What, what so the first thing it? to do is to talk about it, is to be willing to broach the subject with your child gently, um, to talk about it with other people. So 
If, for example, you feel your teen's in a crisis situation and you take them to the adolescent psychiatric department, find, tr talk to a trusted friend about it because so you're going to need someone to talk so to as well. So when you say trusted, so I think one of the important things mm -hmm. for you and your teen or mm -hmm. your adolescent is that there's trust, there's confidentiality. So mm -hmm. how do you, what do you do to establish confidentiality? Well, with a friend or a family member, you pick someone that you feel that way with to begin with. But what may surprise people is as you start talking to others about what your family's going through, you'll find a lot of your friends and family have gone through similar things with their children, mm -hmm. but they never talked about it because of the stigma, because of the shame. Right. And a lot of uh, kids might be on medication like uh, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, an antidepressant, right. or Depakote, or a Lamictal. Yeah. Um, Personally, I'm not an advocate for pharmacological products. There's a lot of people that, that just mm -hmm. want to go holistic. Um, what's, your, what's your scope on that? Um, my scope on that is it depends. If your child is having a psychiatric emergency in which you're afraid they're going to be immediately hurt, a mindfulness program might not be enough. You know, I would trust professionals. Take your child to the psychiatric um, emergency department. Let them get screened. Follow the advice of the professionals. Right. People, children don't have to be on medication forever, but if being on medication for a few months is going to allow your child to become stable and return to wholeness and then maybe transition to right. a more holistic way, the medication's worth it. So, if they so right, for a short time they could take the medication and they'll uh, possibly be off of that. Yeah. And possibly not. It's important to recognize that, that mental health, problems are just the same as any other physical health problem. They're biological problems based on a chemical imbalance in the brain. But we can't if diagnose the chemical though. Well, we don't know how to do that, but so let's say you do Actually, end yeah, up taking your child, teenager perhaps, to a mental health facility mm -hmm. because you feel that you just don't feel safe leaving them alone as you mentioned. And let's say they do require or highly recommend mm -hmm. a stay. What does a stay look okay. like? What's the length of time? Do they give options, or does it become mandatory? I, let me talk about this. This is a really great question. What is that question. called, by the way? A stay is called okay. officially? A stay is called an inpatient stay at a behavioral health unit. Rebacted? Uh, uh, Embacturated or something like oh, that? Oh, is there an act acronym for that? No, um, I don't believe I know yeah, so. Okay. But essentially, when your child, when you go to the psychiatric emergency room, what will happen first is your child will get a physical health screen because sometimes physical health problems like very low blood sugar can masquerade as a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they'll be checked out physically to make sure there's not something physical. They'll also do an alcohol and drug screen. After they're medically cleared, they'll be transferred over to, the psychi to a psychiatric screen, which is typically a psychiatric social worker. The social worker will make the determination whether or not your child needs to have a short inpatient stay at a behavioral health facility, which is what we used to call, which is what we now call psychiatric hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's usually mandatory at that point. You know, if a health professional is saying to you, your child is at a risk of hurting themselves or others and needs care, you typically, you may not be able to refuse that care. Um, and you don't want to. You don't want to take a child that professionals are saying to you, they need care. Um, and not get them that care. What happens if you don't have insurance? Is there a way they would deny you to have that oh. inpatient time for your um, child? They can't. Basically, for emergency room visits. For emergency room visits, but they cannot release a child or an, if they cannot discharge them safely. So what will happen is typically the hospital, if you don't have insurance, will work with you to get um, something through the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is in all 50 states, through Medicaid if you qualify. There are a number of programs to help pay for children's stays, mm -hmm. um, and the hospitals will work with you. But once you go in for care and it's determined that your child needs inpatient care, they cannot refuse to get you to a facility. They're not legally allowed to discharge you if they can't do it safely. Is there some other tips that you can provide parents that once they put them into a stay, I don't know, how long is it typically? So typically it's a four to seven day stay for a short term inpatient behavioral health stay. And the first thing I want to say is it's probably one of the best things that could happen. Which sounds... Embrace it, you're saying. Embrace it. Which sounds right. It feels unusual. like you're in cri your family's in crisis when they're right. there, but instead of 
really feeling in crisis, saying you're mitigating the crisis mitigating at that moment. Because that is the first step towards getting your child the help they need. A lot of times, parents don't realize that their children um, have a mental health problem until it manifests in a critical way. But once it manifests, that's the starting point for getting help. Um, a lot of people have visions of mental health hospitals as something from one flew out of the cuckoo's <laughs> nest, with shambling they in the they halls. They closed a lot of those down. But they're not like that. The adolescent units are really nice units. Colorful straight jackets, you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hopefully um, no straight jackets. Actually, um, some children um, describe mm -hmm. them as kind of a really boring summer camp, mm -hmm. if you want to oh. think about the worst part of it. Okay. So what will happen is your child will be taken typically by ambulance, and you won't be allowed to take them yourself for safety reasons, mm. from the emergency room to the inpatient place. Okay. Um, you'll typically be allowed to go with them and sit with them through admissions to the inpatient um, behavioral health unit. Once they're admitted, though, you're not allowed to go in with them. And that's the most heart-wrenching moment for parents, watching your child walk through those right. doors. So what tips do you have for parents to make their, help their kids at that moment and help themselves and help their family that's at home, kind of what's going on, and the uncle is saying, you know, when I was a kid, you ever do that? We just give them a beating somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, so let me take this in pieces. To help your child, first of all, every one of these places, what will happen is the child will go in. Within 24 hours, they're assessed by a psychiatrist. If they need medication, they'll be given medication. They're on an inpatient stay, so if they have a bad reaction to the medication, they're at a hospital. It's the best possible place to do this. And that's what you say to your family and your relatives. And that's what you say from. They'll be in group therapy every day. They'll be in individual therapy. What you can do to help your child is several things. Every one of these places um, <coughs> will allow you to drop off clothing um, and a hairbrush and sometimes personal hygiene. Um, it's important to take the strings out of all the clothing for safety. They'll make you do that, so just know that Because there could be other patients there that really could be in right. worse shape than your child. Absolutely. There so you have to be considerate about yeah. the, the whole group that so is you, there. So you can't give your child anything that they might um, hurt another child or themselves with. Like shoelaces. Right, like no shoelaces, but you know, bring them their own clothing so they can be comfortable in their own clothing. Bring them some flip-flops or some shoe or slippers or shoes without laces. Sometimes you'll be allowed to bring so paperback books, no hardcover books. Um, every one of these places is visitation. The best thing you can do for your child is show up to every single visitation okay. point. So be involved and be there. Be involved. And what about child? food? What, what if food? they don't like the food they um, found there? Well, some places will allow you to bring food for your child when you visit. They have to eat it during the visit and mm -hmm. you take the leftovers with you and do that. Some places won't. Now, you may go to visit your child and your child may be in a place where they refuse to see you, which is their right. Don't be discouraged. Keep showing up. Your child needs to know that you love them and you're there for them, even when your child is turning away. It's really important to show up, to be there, to participate in the care. But when you're at a visit, keep it light. You know, keep it light. So it's don't not blame, your therapy time. Don't give them any blame for anything that's oh happened, gosh, right? No. Don't if put them down. Don't. You no. know, be positive. Be or really complain positive. about the situation, yeah. like, oh my God, I'll make this missing work so I can see yeah. you, or anything negative like yeah. that. Tell them that you're glad they're in a place where they're going to get help, that you will do everything in your power to help them get help after they leave, that you're sorry that they're in this place, but that this is the chance for things to get better, and that you're glad to be there with them. Make it really clear that you're supporting them through this. And like you said, say nothing negative. But also keep it light. But we can't sugarcoat visit. the whole thing. I mean, they're going to have to do some hard, deep Absolutely. work in themselves to get transformed. But it's not going to happen in those four to seven days. Right. So that's just the that's beginning. That's stabilizing. And that's the thing to understand. Well, what does happen afterwards? I mean, what can you help our audience understand that after that short stay of four to seven mm -hmm. days, what's next? Does this go on indefinitely? Is it for a minimum of several months? The ongoing there's therapy, no what happens? Right, so there's no answer because every child is different and there's a wide range of mental health issues. But what generally happens is your child will be in an inpatient facility for four to seven days. You at that time, that's your time that you have when you know your child's safe for you to work really hard to think about what do you want to discharge. Um, discharge planning isn't always so great at these places. They're great at getting your kids stable. But you have to think about what's next. 
one of the great options, there's lots of great options, one of the things you can do is have your child transition to a partial hospitalization program for a few weeks. So it's an outpatient visit, so a few times a week. Well, and it, it's more than that. An intensive outpatient um, program is instead of going to school every day, your child goes from, let's say, 9 to 5 or 9 to 4, goes to a therapy center. And there they'll get group therapy, they'll get individual therapy, they'll start doing their schoolwork. Um, that center will be in touch with your child's school. They'll send schoolwork. Those centers all have tutors and teachers that come in to work with the kids. And your and child may need to be there for a few weeks. And the state pays for this because it's part of, you know, No Child Left Behind education? Um, the state does not pay for the intensive um, outpatient programs. Those you have to explore ways of paying with the hospital and with the program. Okay. It depends on your insurance. If you don't have insurance, depending on your income level, there are state programs. Um, this is where parents need to do their homework. Um, the next step after that, so your child may need to be there anywhere from three to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of kids after that, remember, your child's mental health crisis didn't just happen. It was a long time coming, and you may have not seen it, and it, but you know about it now, and so now is the time to move forward. Can you just give us a couple of signals that people should just watch out for? Because so many people are caught up in their survival, the day-to-day. Yes. -day. Let's yeah. go to work, drop the kids off, right. do the homework, right. cooking. And, and what do we check? You know, do we need, should we have all access to their cell phones, have the passwords? Facebook um, accounts, perhaps? You know, it's good to monitor your wrists. child's electronic <laughs> um, usage, but that's, you know, other, p other places have covered that. What you want to watch for in your child is emotional things. Is your child withdrawing from usual activities? Do they seem sad all the time? Are they sleeping a lot? Are they not sleeping enough? Do they seem really anxious? Are they withdrawing from friends? Um, do you suspect that they're engaging in self-harm? Do you suspect that they're thinking about killing themselves? And it's important to talk to your child about it. Really hard to do calmly, but important to do it non-judgmentally. And to say to your child, hey, you know, have you ever thought about killing yourself? And then, like, stop talking and listen. Because a lot of times as parents, I think we want to talk and talk and talk So and the key talk. is listen. Don't lecture, but listen. Don't lecture, but listen. And if your child says they've thought about it, get help. That may not mean you have to run to the adolescent psychiatric emergency room. You may be able to prevent things getting that far. Right. But if you, you know, but get, still get them help. Find, um, you can go through your pediatrician. Every county has a family service organization. Go on their website, call them up, ask where you can find resources right. for your and child. A lot and of I kids don't, don't want to talk about it. They said, uh, I, there's nothing I really yeah, have to say about it. Yeah, what do you do if they just blow it off? Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to communicate with you. Your questions, yeah. right. Um, you do a couple of things. Um, it depends, again, this is where you have to use your gut as a parent. There's no absolute checklist I can give you. Um, you keep the lines of communication open. If you think something's really wrong, take them to a counselor and leave the room. You know, a lot of times your child may be relieved they have someone to talk to, but they're not going to say it in front of you. They may not want to say what's going on in front of mom or dad. They might be embarrassed. They might right. feel awkward. Um, so get them to a professional and then go sit outside and let them talk to that professional alone. And then the professional will never tell you what your child said because they're not allowed to. And we as parents, we don't need to know need everything. To it's not about us. Exactly. It's about what their success. But the professional will tell you what you need to do for your child. So mm -hmm. they may not say, oh, your child said X. Now, they will tell you if your child is threatening to hurt themselves or someone else. And That's they'll tell the kid they'll tell you. mandated reporting. It's mandated reporting. Um, well, actually, mandated reporting is a little different. Mandated reporting is not about telling parents. It's about telling an authority. Um, but, but that has to be reported. It has to be reported, yeah, but they, they will tell that. you. So what's mandated reporting? It's for Mandated what? reporting um, is a generic term for a lot of things. So for example, for physical and sexual abuse of children, if um, a child discloses to a teacher, a police officer, or even a Girl Scout leader, um, a health care professional, a mental health care professional, that they've been physically or sexually abused, that, per that professional is mandated to report the abuse to the authorities. To the police. To the police um, or to um, to children and family services. DCP and P is DCP, called now. Yeah, they're obligated to report it to some authority. Um, and who exactly they're obligated to report to varies okay. by state and varies right. by Right, so you, you enumerated one uh, mandated reporting. What's another mandated reporting? Um, if there's 
a serious um, concern that the child is going to hurt themselves or somebody else, um, they can mandate that the child go to an adolescent psychiatric emergency room, get further screening, and the child can be involuntarily committed for a few days to do further screening and to find out what's going on. Yeah. And I've got to say, I, there's a very large percentage of the population that owns as, you know, one mm -hmm. of the parents own a handgun or a rifle. Yeah. Is, and you find the situation starting to emerge in any level mm -hmm. whatsoever, uh, whatsoever with your child, should you just take a precaution of removing your guns from your home and maybe giving it to a friend to hold on to? Uh, well, they're already locked. Well, well ho hopefully. Hopefully, but I even if they're not, well, kids right. are smart. So first Especially of all, teenagers. if you have weapons in your house, they should be secured where your children can't get them. They yeah, should they be unloaded. They have these fingerprint locks. You well, not everybody a, has a, a fingerprint lock. Uh, no. So there are a lot of ways to secure weapons. If you don't think that's enough, if you even think that there's a danger to your child, remove them. Um, sometimes if your child is thinking about cutting themselves or hurting themselves, lock up all your knives. It might be inconvenient right. to have to go to your locked room and get a knife every time you want to cut or a vegetable. Scissors even, right? Or scissors even, But uh, you know, it, it seems uh, impractical. How can you lock every sharp object away? They could find, a, they could sharpen a stick outside in the backyard if they wanted to do harm. It's not as impractical as it sounds. You do okay. the best you can. Okay. Um, you know, if you're at the point where you think your child is going to harm yourself, you should be talking to a professional. Yes. You know, not okay. just guessing what you should be hiding on your sure. own. Oh, of the course. The professional will say to you, you know, your child's talking about killing themselves with m medication. You may have to lock, it's inconvenient, when of course it is. You may have you to lock up your medications. So very important thing. Yeah. When do you need to assert yourself above what a professional is saying, where you don't feel right, the professionals you don't feel is doing all the right things? Yeah. How do you steer this or drive this ship um, you do it, well, you educate yourself, mm -hmm. and there are wonderful websites. The National Institute of Mental Health has a good one. Um, most state health departments have one. You educate yourself before you go in. You figure out what you want for your child. You talk to the professional about it. If you think the professional is really wrong, you go to another professional. I know, but sometimes I'm concerned or someone is concerned mm -hmm. that they may say the wrong thing. It's just like mandated reporting. You say the wrong thing, even as a joke. Mm -hmm they may take this out of proportion. That usually doesn't happen with it professionals. Does. Okay. You know, prof the especially children's mental health professionals are there to help your child. But of course, you have to be the ultimate decider. Mm -hmm. What can really be helpful, and I can't say this enough, is getting support for yourself and your family. Because it's not just your child that What does that mean? Support. There are support groups, There perhaps? are support groups. It means, and I, again, like going. Join a meetup group? Um, there's well. not many groups. Again, there are these things in New Jersey that are called family support organizations. Mm -hmm. um, every state has them, just about every county. Find the family support organization for your um, county. Yeah, there's one called FACE, right? There's, for one, called, um, there's oh. one called FACE. There's one called um, oh, I'm blanking. I know through Jewish Family Services, yeah. they have right. some. Jewish Family so Services have some. In um, Morris and Sussex County, there's a group called Caring Partners that can put you in the right direction. Um, find the family support groups, they have meetings every week, every other week. They usually have someone you can email or even mm -hmm. someone you can call. Get in touch with other families who are going through the same thing. Find out what they're doing. Um, go to those meetings. And I know that everyone's busy. You know, we're working. We're now trying to take care well, of a mentally ill kid. We're but we could do a search on Google and find right. we can, results. Yeah, we can talk to someone on the phone. And uh, you know what? Sometimes this prioritization trumps being too busy because Absolutely. God forbid you don't want the alternative. What happens if you decide your busy schedule, which of course is a real thing. Yeah. We're not making up that you don't have to do all the things to work and right. take care of your household. But if you don't pay the proper amount of attention to this crisis yeah. and how to live beyond it, because people think the crisis mm -hmm. is the immediate need for the psychiatric right. care. But right now, we have to project out mm -hmm. what's getting beyond that immediate crisis to mitigate it. And this could be a year or years of work. And sometimes a parent will lose their opportunity to earn income. They've got to be OK with yeah. less income, improved family. And that's the main thing is you know, when your child's in crisis, your focus is on the child. Not to blame the child at all, but to help the child. And to keep in mind that someone having a mental illness is no different than someone having diabetes. And we wouldn't blame some. We wouldn't blame our child if they had diabetes. You know, we shouldn't blame our child if they have a mental illness. The object is to get them the help they need. Right. So to quickly reiterate, um, 
you know, if there's an intense crisis, your child may spend a short amount of time in an in inpatient hospitalization. That will get them stable. That's just the beginning. They may transfer from there to an intensive outpatient hospitalization for a few weeks. That will help get them ready to get back to school, ready to function in their day-to-day -day life. When they go back to school, this is really critical. You have to tell the school. If your child has an individualized education plan, an IEP, an IEP, you're going to want that modified. You're going to want yes. to figure out what your kid needs and put it in there. If your child does not, you have to request in writing that your school's child study team meet to evaluate your child and provide um, them with what they need. Now, right. none of this will cost you any money because that the schools are legally... Even homeschooling if it's necessary. Yeah, even homeschooling, your local public school will, is legally obligated to provide you with the services your child needs to get the education they're entitled to. After, if I don't mind, after they come out of intensive um, in outpatient hospitalization, they may be in an after-school program for several weeks where they're back in school and then they're going two to four times a week after school to therapy um, to further work on their issue. And then after that, they may transition to where they're meeting with the therapist once a week. Now, where you said it's three to four times a week, does that mean the parent then drives them to a meeting several times a week? Or do they have a pickup service? How would that work? Um, every place is different. Many of the places that offer after school therapeutic programs will pick your child up from school. Wow, that's even better. Yeah. Less you, stress for the parents. Yes, yeah, so your child will be picked up from school, but you will have to pick your child up. They, most of these places do not offer a service mm -hmm. where at 5.30 they drive your child home. But at least it's half the battle, so right. it's helpful to parents who right. are working. Right, so you're working, you know, your child is taken from school to the after school program. You pick them up from the after school program and then you come home. Now, in addition to um, the child having therapy, most of these programs have a family therapy component as well, and you want to participate in that. Now, Dr. Plichta, this has been extremely important information. That This is why we wanted to give you our undivided attention for our entire episode, because this is life-changing, not just for the child, the teenager in crisis and living beyond that crisis, but it, it does encompass the whole family. So to make sure the parents become that child's advocate in school, outside of school, in their psychiatric care, and of course, to be communicating with the siblings of appropriate age and what's going on with that child in question. Yeah, it's all about responding. We, we as parents yes. have to be responsible. The ability to respond is so key. It's about responding, and remember, you don't have to respond alone. There are, there's a lot of support in the community for parents going through this, and many more people than you think are struggling with yeah. helping a child that has a mental health issue. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been fantastic yeah. information, and I know there's many, many people who now know what to do, God forbid this happens, to their family.